Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. The show is produced and broadcast from the Portland, Oregon, USA metropolitan area. And for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there, about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals and about whatever it is we have decided to, to talk about. The title of today's show is A Conversation with a Haitian Immigrant. Herman Colas. Herman Colas. <laughs> yes. Thank you for coming on. Um, how are you feeling right now? Oh, I'm, I'm doing all right, and uh, I'm glad to be with you, Don. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We had a brief meeting a short time ago before you came on the show, and we talked about things and uh, got a feel for each other. And uh, as uh, my friend was saying earlier this evening, uh, instead of one hour, we're going to need two or three hours to cover what you're all about. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, Good to see you. Nice seeing you again. So as you know, the show goes in two parts. The first part is uh, what I call the bio part, where we talk about who you are personally uh -huh. and uh, things like that, so that people will have an idea where you're coming from when you talk about uh, other things in the second half of the show. So, and if I ask you a question or make a comment that you disagree with, just slap me or yell at me and we'll just keep going. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, shall we start? Yeah. Okay. You were. born uh, uh, when and where now some of these questions we already know but let's follow the format yeah. uh, when and where were you born well yeah i was born in in paul prince haiti and and the year 1948. 1948 so it's been uh, a few a few a few years okay. that have accumulated on me and uh, is well reflected by my white goatee here <laughs> <laughs> and the lines of wisdom. <laughs> yes. I, in that too. It may be. <laughs> I did enjoy so much our visiting when we were having lunch together. Yes. Looking forward I, to some I, more I of it now. I certainly did. And uh, I always have a trick, question, a trick question or two. Can I ask you a trick question now? Go, go ahead. If I can, I will be able to answer it. Good. Why were you born? Why was I born? I asked you first. Uh, no, I am. I'm just digesting. I of think course. I was. I I was born because uh, <coughs> the universe thought that maybe I'd have something to offer, uh -huh. and that's what I've been trying to do during all those years that have accumulated on me. So was the universe pretty wise when they thought you had something of importance to offer to the universe? I think that was a good decision on their part because, <laughs> <laughs> because you know, my, in my family, uh, my mom and dad initially had four daughters. And uh, after the last daughter, my dad was thinking that, well, that said the universe isn't going to give him a son. So he stopped. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, like we just said, the universe had different plan. Mm -hmm. So six years later, after my last sister, I was born. Ah, <laughs> so you're bringing up the rear. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, if I were to ask your best friend, who is Erman? What would your best friend say? Erman is what? Er Erman was kind of an old guy even when he was young. He always would be telling us, you can do this, but you shouldn't do that. And uh, so that when uh, I got old enough to really move away from them, sometimes I thought they were very happy. They say, oh, my gosh, he won't be around to tell us what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> I love your accent. It's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Um, anything significant worth mentioning about your cultural heritage right now? We'll be getting more deeply into mm -hmm. it as time goes on. But anything comes to mind right now that's significant about your racial or cultural heritage? Well, actually, the, the part that 
be interesting is really that, that being born in Haiti mm -hmm. and, uh, and, 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 and really born in the family that I was born, I have never taken that for granted. In fact, I've always told people that I thought that uh, many times people wish that they would win the lottery, but being born in Haiti and being born in the family that I was born was equivalent to having really uh, won the lottery. Yeah. Yeah. So that's <laughs> where were, I feel you, that. You were very mm, fortunate. I was very fortunate and that's what shaped my cultural heritage. Okay. Uh, a religious preference, do you have one? Uh, I was born in, in a Catholic family and my, my mom was a very strict uh, Catholic person. In fact, uh, me, when, when the changes were made where the masses were no longer being done in Latin, she was not very happy about it. And neither was mine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Were you an altar boy? Uh, well, for a while, yes. Yeah. Because my mom they thought, you know, during the time, perhaps like when you and I were born, there was this idea that the first sons also should become a priest. Yes. Things got yeah. to that I didn't quite go that far. <laughs> Why didn't you go that far? Well, uh, I, 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 I guess those were the area where the strictness uh, kind of really weighed on me and then I thought maybe I don't want to go that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you uh, have a particular religion now or are you a religious? I am more like a, a religious person. I, I, I have not really he, he, he said that I don't want to be Catholic, but I'm not a practicing Catholic. Let's uh -huh. put it that way. Yeah. Yes. You see that right there in my chest, that hole? Yes. You know what that's from, don't you? No. Too many mere copas. <laughs> <laughs> Had you heard that before? <laughs> I, yes. Yes, too many times oh we my have God. to do that. Yes. I have calluses on my knee <laughs> yes. from kneeling down. Kneeling and down. And and Yes. And the stations of the cr never mind. This is your story, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's nice to hear that part of my story has al already been lived also. Because you know, sometimes you see the place and you think, oh my gosh, I'm alone on this or I'm alone on that, the, which is the unfortunate part that too many people do. They yeah. think that they are in this world all by themselves. Yes. And uh, well, none of us are here by ourselves. Even when we do not practice religion or what have you, it doesn't mean that I am not a spiritual person. I do believe that there is an essence, that there are uh, things that are supposed to be done in this world for the good of not just you personally, but for the good of people around you as well. Mm. Yeah. Uh, people from time to time they mention they are a spiritual person. And I always ask them, what does that mean to you? You're a spiritual person. What is a spiritual person? To me, a spiritual person is someone that really understands that this world is not made simply for the benefit and that uh, uh, things that are happening is not just for for them to really take care of themselves and themselves alone. The spiritual person is someone, in my opinion, yes. that really look at uh, the need of others and uh, try at, at the best to understand it. Even if they are not able to do everything about it, at least they can send a request to the universe in terms of being able to say something positive to people rather than put them down just so that they can make themselves feel good. How do you have to think the way that you do? Is your mom or dad or both or the culture or what? I think it, my mom and dad both really uh, did everything possible to 
to really put that in all of us. In fact, uh, one of the things I remember is like uh, when I was growing up in the distillery, for instance, uh, my dad after mass would take all of us and go start the meal and have us, the kids in the family, go take the sugar cane and feed it to the meal so that we can understand that even though we were benefiting from the bounties of what uh, that they were doing in the family, that the people that normally do this work, they wanted us to understand what they were yeah. doing so that we didn't just go around with our nose bent upward thinking that we were better than the people who did the work. And you learned that? And from that, we learned that really everybody had, uh, a, you know, a, a responsibilities and that if they were doing something that at some point that you would not have to do, that it did not mean that you were a better person, a better spiritual person than that person, mm -hmm. that you should treat everyone with the respect that they deserve. So that was something that was ingrained in us at a very young age. So you learned some humility. Yes. Yeah. Yes, very early. Yes. Mm -hmm. And your formal education, let's go to that. My formal education was really very, very strict. Also, of course, I went to the seminary initially, and then uh, Later on, of course, I I got transferred in a mixed school, and I thought that was nice because uh, I had gotten tired of being with only the boys, so it was kind of nice to really <laughs> go someplace where you could look at the girls too. <laughs> <laughs> you still like to look at the girls? <laughs> well, yes, yes, I still look at them, you know. They, the eyes are there, you know. You, you can still use these eyes, like I tell my wife all the time, I say, the eyes is still there. You, you better know? be careful what you're saying because she's going to see this program. You know? Well, yes, I know, but I've already <laughs> told her that she knows what to expect. <laughs> that uh, I, 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 I don't really look in, in ways that would embarrass her. Of course. <laughs> my wife yells at me. She says, there's a difference between taking a peek and, and staring. I said, exactly. <laughs> that I can, I can agree with. <laughs> and those were the kind of things like you see, like when my friends, like when I was, I say, man, you cannot look so hard. What are you doing? And, and they say, you're not my father. I say, well, maybe you didn't hear your dad. I'm just trying to tell you what he would have said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so the education you were to talk about, huh? Mm -hmm. And uh, you took an advanced degree too? Uh, well, yeah, when, when, when I uh, came, actually my, my family did first sent me here to, to go to the university because they were thinking that uh, after I had my graduation in Haiti, that I should come and get a degree actually in uh, mechanical engineering was what my dad wanted me to, to be doing so that I would have uh, continued with, uh, with uh, a, a managing a, and developing the distillery. But, uh, well, that wasn't to be because I came here and... Uh, what year was that when that you first was, came here? That was in... 1969, uh -huh. and uh, the Vietnam War was going during that time, mm -hmm. yes. And then uh, as I was going to school, I was with a friend of mine, and then we started to talk and what have you. And then uh, he said, well, we should probably go and serve because, uh, you know, we, we were talking in terms of uh, our beliefs and things about whether it was going to help to fight, quote, communism and what have you. So <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> so we, we, we volunteered, uh -huh. uh, the two of us, and uh, 
at that time, I guess it was uh, it was something the. Uh, they were looking for young men to send to that war. So even though when I was first here, I was a student, they didn't care. They figured, well, if you want to volunteer, we'll take you. Mm -hmm. So I did volunteer to serve, and then uh, so did my friend, and uh, we both went to Fort Dix, New Jersey mm -hmm. for training. But during uh, the training, the friend that talked about that with me changed his mind, and my dad helped him to get out of this thing. And, uh, and then he asked me as well if I wanted to get out too. Mm -hmm. But I knew my dad very well. He had not sent me to join. That was a decision of my own. And I thought that if I told my dad, well, yes, I want to get out, he would have lost all sorts of respect for me. And the respect of my dad was important to me. Of course. So I said, no, Papa, I'm not getting out. No matter what happened, I'm going to put the time because that was my decision. He said, well, when you start something, you should finish it. He said, it's not that I'm not afraid about what might happen to my first son, but when people make decisions, they have to live by them. So I was glad I didn't jump in and say, <laughs> yes, please help me get out. <laughs> so I did stay in and served yeah. during that time. Uh, I'm not remembering anybody talking about their father in terms of Papa. And that was me. Mm -hmm. We called him Papa. Yes. And that, that feels good to hear that a special respect yes. in our culture, if I may. Yes. What was it like in Vietnam for you? Well, actually, that's the part. I, I did not get to go to Vietnam. You know, when I joined, they sent me to Fort Dix and then they trained me. They trained me in, in uh, signal call, you know. Uh -huh. And after I was trained in signal call, exactly because I was not a citizen of this country at that time, when they gave me my, uh, my uh, papers that I was supposedly going to Vietnam, they stopped it and they say, we cannot have this guy go and be on, on signal call because he will be in the middle of uh, receiving information and what have you. And they say, we do not think he has the clearance to be doing this thing. So they stopped me from going. So maybe that was a fortunate uh, decision. Uh, in huh? a certain way, maybe that's how it came out. <laughs> and then they took me and sent me back to train me as a medic. And that's what they did. And after I became a medic, they sent me to William Beaumont General Hospital in Texas, which was a, an hospital right across from Fort Bliss. Uh -huh. And then many of the returnees I would be involved in bringing back and what have you. So, yeah, it turned out to be okay, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Although many times while I was there, I didn't like it for that reason that every day when you get up, you have to go look at the list of people to find out where you were being transferred. So. If in my mind at the time I thought, well, if they were going to send me, they should just send me. At least I know I have the this anxiety thing behind. is over. The anxiety is over. But they didn't do that. So I spent all my time, you know, being very anxious about what would happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that yes. was okay with you? That was okay. I did my service and was. Uh, eh, 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 done with it and uh, receive uh, an honorable discharge and everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have an advanced degree? I got my degree in mathematics and computer science, oh yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You mm -hmm. must be pretty bright, huh? Uh, somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, talk a little bit about what you uh, uh, did in, in your working life. You're, you're about to retire now completely. Right? Uh, well, uh, uh, sort, I, I, of. I, sort of. I keep telling, I keep telling uh, 
uh, my kids are bought well. Now that I have established these things, it's time for you now to start working and send me a check instead of me having to come and earning it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've not quite bought into it totally yet, but we are working on them. <laughs> <laughs> so they are then running the business? They are running the business at this point, yes. And say who they are, boys uh, and girls? Uh, I have, I have uh, three kids. Yeah. Actually, I, I, I like my papa, I started with a girl. She is the eldest. And then four years later, I had my first son. And uh, I thought, well, I have a boy and a girl now that should do it. Mm -hmm. But my wife was not consenting because she came from a family of just two. That was her and her sister. And she always felt that her family should be at least three. Because when you are not in agreement with one, you can side with the other <laughs> one, she told me. <laughs> Having come from a large family, I had all of that. So I didn't, I, that's the part maybe I had taken for granted. Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. so she held on and we had one more son, which was almost another s seven years later after my first son. And they're all involved with the and business. And now they are all involved in my business, yes. And the business is a general contract. It's a general contracting and, uh, and we, we started doing residentials eh, eh, when we first started. And the reason for that was that prior to my having that, I was involved into a, a believe it or not, when that happened, I say, isn't that something? A, a, during my service, I was in telecommunication where they say I shouldn't be allowed to do because mm -hmm. that's what would have sent me to Vietnam. And then after I got my degree, I got hired by, uh, by Pacific Northwest Bell at the time. Which communication? Which was <laughs> communication. <laughs> so I spent quite a few years in in communication, and uh, I did very well in it. And I was building my dream house when I hired a general contractor while I was doing a lot of traveling. Uh -huh. And uh, that general contractor did not do a good job, so I fired him. And then I started to do the thing on my own. Mm -hmm. And as I did that, I say, well, if I decide to get into something outside of telecommunication, maybe I will do this so people do not have to go through the hard time that I went with that general contractor. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started that business. And how long has it been going on? The general and contracting? that's since uh, 1997. That's a while. That's quite a while, yes. And the kids are managing and it well? And the kids are managing it well. And today, we are no longer involved into, into residential construction. It's mostly commercial, commercial, industrial construction. That's what we do, yes. Uh, do they send you any money yet because you're retired or are you in, in the process now? Well, they, 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 they send me some money, but I, I, I'm trying to make them realize that maybe when you retire, you need more money than what they send me. <laughs> 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 oh, they pull up with you, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, your political persuasion, do you see yourself as left, right, center, or, or none of the above, huh? politically? Generally speaking, generally speaking, I feel like I am uh, I am a progressist. Progressive. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> of course I do. Yeah. Yes. Uh, memberships in uh, political, social, or civic organizations. You have any memberships worth mentioning? Uh, in terms of it, when I say I'm a progressist, in terms of what I support and yes, the things yes. that I do, I uh, I tend to be a, a v more liberal in terms of my attitude with uh, what should happen. In yeah. terms of the business, I still feel that uh, 
the company is not just me, it's really all my employees. So I believe in treating all employees in the right manner. So those are the kind of things that I, I really push and, uh, and spend time when I am uh, involved in any kind of organization. Do yeah. you pay your employees fairly? Yes. I think I know the answer to that. <laughs> I didn't want to put you on the, I thought you would. Yes. A little yeah. I know about you so far. Yes. We, we treat them fairly. We treat them with dignity. And we feel that uh, uh, they are really uh, 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 an integral part of what our company is. And this is one of the reasons that I believe that we are able to attract a very excellent people mm -hmm. in, in that company. In fact, we have people who, who actually have joined our company, leaving much larger businesses to join us because they feel they like the values that we push forward. And how you treat them. Yes. Oh, sounds very good. We, we're trying to find a chink in your armor somewhere. I'll keep going. <laughs> <You're all right. laughs> no, of course yes. not. Uh, any persons uh, from the past or alive today that you particularly admire or look up, looked up to? Any names come to mind for you? Well, yes, uh, of course, uh, you know, people like Martin Luther King, yes. you know, and uh, Gandhi, you know, and uh, 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 and, and people might think, okay, if you're in business, that would not happen. But I've also like uh, Malcolm X, for instance, because I remember when I first came here no. and I read about him, and I thought uh, that was a very interesting man, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Many times people talk about him, for instance, in terms of, oh my gosh, this guy was a revolutionary, he was this or he was that. But personally, when I have read him, I thought this guy was really an, uh, a very evolving human being. Yes. Well, That's wait, what wait, I wait. picked from everything that he, he was wow. doing. Because I saw him go from one position and moving to other position that I thought, well, wow, he was this growing, person is uh, growing. And to me, that's a very important part of life, to grow and yes. not remain static yes. with where you've been and thinking that this is the only place one should be. Yeah. You're speaking for me. I, there's one person I admire that you didn't mention. I'm surprised because we, we seem to be and, and the same level of progressiveness, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus. Oh, uh, this is without question. <laughs> <laughs> this is without question. Of yes. course. <laughs> yes. So if we don't take a break, my director's going to yell at us. Shall we take a break, Mr. E? staying tuned. And for your viewers who missed the opening of the show, you're watching Conversations with Dr. Don. Uh, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people, like most of you like out there, about who they are and about whatever it is we decided to talk about. And my guest this evening is Herman Colas, I'm trying to use the French pronunciation, but I can't even do English very well. <laughs> <laughs> and we're having a good time. The title of the show, as you've seen on the screen, is A Conversation with a Haitian Immigrant. So let's continue on with some more questions. You ready? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
He moved from New York to Portland in 1974. Why did you move from New York to Portland? Well, uh, du during, during my service, I had met somebody from Oregon. And uh, actually, one friend of mine uh, had, uh, had uh, a, a, a girlfriend that he met in Haiti. And that girlfriend was actually from Oregon. She came as an exchange student and attended the school. It was a private school in Haiti that she attended uh, so that she would learn uh, 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 to speak French. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember when she came in and she said that she was from Oregon. At that time, we were not paying that much attention. I had absolutely no idea what part of the United States Oregon uh, was and didn't care because I thought uh, we were never going to see her again anyway. Ah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what happened, her man? Well, my, my friend <laughs> fell in love with that uh, woman and then came somehow all the way to Oregon and then uh, they were getting married. And that was during the time of my service. So I flew up here in Oregon for the first time in 1971 uh -huh. to visit them. That was uh, on the 4th of July of 71 because they were going to get married in December of 71. So I came up and met her again. And then that's when actually I met her sister also. Uh -huh. So I came back to be the best man in, 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 in that December of 71. Mm -hmm. And then after that, the sister started to write to me, you know, while I was still in the service, but I was not really thinking that would go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then we kept on writing to one another. And then this became more serious. That is really one of the reasons why I uh, came Moon. here in 74 <laughs> and why my father totally lost me. <laughs> <laughs> because she took you away. She took me away. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a good ride so and far. It's been a good ride, yes. We've been together now for over 40 some years now. Yeah. Yes. What does she do besides looking over the grandchildren? Well, she, she, she was a teacher and she's retired now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so her, her grandkids is one of the things that uh, she is totally into. Uh, Sometimes now I, I feel like, hey, can I become a grandkid too? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Native Oregonian she was. A native Oregonian. So that's how I, yeah, that's how I moved here in Oregon in 74. And uh, we were married in 75, yeah. yes. And financially, you're comfortable. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. So you talk about your daughter and your son joining the company, and you have a nephew who joined as well. Yes. It's a and family affair. It's a family <laughs> affair. In fact, that nephew is the son of that friend of mine that I came in, uh, that married uh, my, wife, uh, my wife's sister. So she's on, on, on my wife's side of the family. And, and, and yeah, and he is uh, a part of the company as well. Yeah, a very important part of the company. Well, it sounds like uh, quite an interesting arrangement. There's somebody at the head of this whole operation who has some concern for human welfare and human decency. Yes. So, is you, are you a nice man? <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. An entrepreneurial family, but you know what it's like to be uh, the underclasses, so to speak. Yes. Uh, uh, Three grandsons. You're helping in the growth of, the com of our community. You're interested in that, having a prosperous company and helping in the growth 
of the community. What does that mean for you, helping in the growth of the community? Well, one, one, one of the part that I, I saw is that uh, if, and, and the business that we are in, in construction, there aren't really a lot of diversity yes. in construction. And I felt that one of the reasons is that uh, a lot of people that uh, perhaps look like me do not really know or understand what construction is, except that from time to time they see somebody who look like themselves and me with a flag or something, so they think that this That's is about the limit, huh? the limit of what could be done. So many times, like I have gone to schools and talked about really my company and tried to encourage young people to understand that there is more to construction than just digging a hole, and that construction involves architecture, engineering and uh, all sorts of painting and plumbing, electrical. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I also uh, make arrangements for the kids to be able to come and visit sites so that they can see what really is involved. And uh, we spend time trying to develop young people and uh, we hire some adults and train them as well so that they can get to see uh, people that are uh, like themselves, that are really earning a living rather than just get a job. And that is what That's we difference. are doing. And this is one of the reasons that I've been interested in seeing that this company goes more than just me trying to earn a living, yeah. but creating a, an environment where it can go that people can understand that we provide a career, not just a job. Mm. Yeah. You have a delightful way of thinking. And again, I'll ask you, <laughs> where that come from, mostly from mom or dad or from both? I think both of them uh, really had instilled those uh, yeah. uh, and us really uh, 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 at a very young Age. And of course, having kind of moved away from my parents' distillery because my dad ran this distillery from his parents. And if I would have continued, in fact, in 2013, would have made 100 years of uh, in that distillery's life. And and I've, I had always felt that, my gosh, I walked away. I must do something that at least if in this afterlife I were to meet my papa again, I'd say, listen, even though I didn't do it the way you expected, I did, I did do right. something that should make <laughs> you feel good, that I didn't just walk away and not do anything. I've always carried that little thing, you know, yeah. like you see, yeah. Uh, what was it like when you were growing up in Haiti? Any particular events or situations that made a lasting memory for you? Anything comes to mind? Like the earthquake? You weren't there for that. Uh, the earthquake, uh, I was not there for that, but yes, it did do a, 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 a very important uh, a, a, impact on me. In fact, in fact, that was something that even for my living here in Portland, when that happened and my company was functioning here already, and there was a very large meeting of construction uh, owners that were taking place here in Portland. And uh, I went to that meeting and, uh, you know, the head of a lot of the large companies around here uh, uh, wanted for me to speak to them about what had happened and what have you. And they did it in such a way that frankly, uh, uh, like, uh, like I said during the time that we met, I said for long I thought that I was the only Haitian 
in here in Portland doing what I was doing. But uh, all those guys in the room were so intent on trying to do things as best as they could in Haiti. In fact, uh, uh, I formed a foundation that was giving money during the earthquake, and they all greatly contributed to that. Mm -hmm. And that's when I said that a really I was not the only Haitians here, that they were all Haitians. So that had really left uh, quite uh, an imprint on uh, my fellow uh, uh, general uh, contractors yeah. felt about the country where I came from. I've heard in the news that uh, the people who committed to help out in the situation in Haiti a lot of them have reneged and not followed through with, with their generosity. Well, uh, uh, that's, that's uh, uh, somewhat true and somewhat not true. For instance, like maybe it's just like a, a, a when money was being given, the thing was that a, a lot of people wanted to make sure that the money would go to the right organization mm -hmm. that would do something substantial and good with that money. Sure. And in fact, even like when I formed uh, uh, the Colas Foundation, I wanted to make sure also that money would go to the right organization, which is why I, I really joined the OCC, which is uh, a good organization here that would make sure that the money I was able to raise was distributed to the right group so that we, we had them assign money to Mercy Corps and uh, uh -huh. Doctor with Fourth Frontier and quite a number of organizations which I thought uh, were in Haiti long before the earthquake doing good work. So I thought yeah. money should go to them. And certainly also part of the money went uh, to, to the Red Cross, which I thought would have done something good. Unfortunately, the Red Cross received almost, uh, a, you know, half billion dollars. Uh -huh. and. Uh, like you're saying, they did not spend it very well at all. So I heard. Yeah. So I was uh, very disappointed to find that an organization that I thought would have done okay. In fact, they, with $500 million, they built only five houses. That's outrageous. This is totally egregious. I, I do not understand what happened. Graft. <laughs> so, what is going to be happening uh, to Haiti in the future? Uh, are they going to recover beyond where they were before the earthquake? It's been a, a very poor country it's for a long, been, long time. It's, it's been it's been a country that has seen so many bad things. Uh, 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 I tell you, it's something that's beyond my understanding because uh, the diaspora of Haitians, whether it's in America or anywhere you go to meet them, they always function at very high level. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, in this country that we are all from, it's very hard for them to do as well when they are there as when they are outside. That part I have not been able to quite understand. Whether it's doctors, engineers, and what have you. And, and even like when we talk about the difference in classes, people that, for instance, came in this country that were from the lower classes, they came here they study, they do very hard things and become very successful mm -hmm. right here in America. Mm -hmm. But in Haiti, they were not uh, given those very same latitude, which uh, I have always personally blamed the, the folks in charge mm -hmm. in, in Haiti for not really shedding the classism and allow the rest of the people to, to really go. 
And if, a, if generation after generation uh, realizes that in their lifetime they had no success or no aspirations mm -hmm. beyond uh, digging a ditch or something like that, and to get past that takes a lot of generations. And then, in my opinion, there are certain people in the ruling class in America who are not interested in black people yeah. on this island. They're being independent and uh, having a voice of their own rather than being of on course, my soapbox. <laughs> yes, of, of course, of course, that's the part about uh, those people. When, when, when uh, initially we became independent, our ancestors, they did something that uh, <laughs> nobody expected. I mean, they defeated the, 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 the army of Napoleon, Napoleon, you know, and, uh, and sometimes even people in America do not understand the value that Haiti had for America being the way that it is today. Because without Napoleon's army being defeated in Haiti, there would have been no no Louisiana purchase. And when people are talking about the Louisiana purchase, it's not like the state of Louisiana. I, I, it's and huge. too many people do not realize that that was one of the great gifts of Haiti to America by defeating Napoleon's army. What's happening nowadays between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, and what's their relationship like, and why is it the way that it is? Well, from the time when Haiti became independent, Haiti was a single a, a, a island under Toussaint Louverture. The whole island was a, really managed by, uh, by the Haitians. Uh -huh. And then after Toussaint Louverture and uh, after our independence some 25 years later, the whole island was managed by, uh, by the Haitians. But uh, the powers that be did not think that a, 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 a group of people like the Haitians should be in charge of uh, the whole island. And that uh, was divided where, uh, like you could see when you look at the map, it's like almost two-thirds of the island went to the Dominican and one-third stayed with the Haitians. Who and drew the line? Supposedly those lines were, uh, you know, like the, uh, when, when the treaties were written, when uh, the, 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 the religious orders were in charge, oh, you know. Good old religion. Yeah, so they said this side was for, for, for the Spanish and this side was for the French. As you, you remember, like uh, when Christophe Columbus went out, that was the way he, he had discovered uh, the island and there were all the papers from, uh, from uh, a, 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 the Catholic religion, oh, which yes, yes. really made a lot of ways about who should be in charge of what. And, uh, and the, the Dominicans were not really doing very well under Toussaint and everybody before, but uh, at one point in time, uh, uh, this guy was going to go and subdue the, the Dominicans, and then uh, they were going to, to get rid of him, and then so he stopped the campaign and returned in Paul Prince. That was Emperor Suluk that did that. Mm -hmm. So after that, the two countries then became separated. In fact, uh, later on, the guy that started the kind of problem that we're seeing today was uh, Tuhilio. But even Tuhilio uh -huh. was born in Haiti. He was. Huh? Yes. Said, yeah. Do you know? But it's again this thing about playing race cards, about, well, I'm lighter, I am darker, I am this or that. That is the kind of play that people 
have. That is still going on and today. And that's still going on today because uh, uh, the Dominicans uh, under Twilio, they established this thing that they were what they call themselves the Blanco de la Tierra and then supposedly Haitians are African descent. So oh, uh, even, yeah, even the Africans that are mixed uh, feel that they are, quote, better than the Africans that are not mixed. So this is what you're seeing in the Dominican Republic today. So they are really rounding up people that looks more African than quote European, even if you are dark. Uh -huh. And then saying those must be Haitian, even though they've been born in the Dominican the Republic. Republic all this time. Now, they want to send them, quote unquote, back to Haiti. It would be just like somebody saying today that my kids are not American, send them to Haiti. They do not know anything Who about is Haiti. Who that kind of thinking? This is the part that you say, where do people get these ideas? It's, it's, uh, it's crazy to me, but then we have few people that are sick in our world. <laughs> <laughs> no. So Papa Doc yeah. was black. He wasn't a mixed, was he? Mm -mm. And yet he was uh, the dictator. Yes. Yeah. And then how did he manage to achieve that level of importance considering the race card that was played? Well, uh, he, 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 what he did, he established a, a pseudo army that he called the Totomaku. Oh, yes. Yes. Butchers. And uh, he, 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 he used that against the people and, uh, and he was like we were talking before, he was only interested in himself and uh, not really in uh, the country because he did not really develop the country. In fact, uh, a quite a large number of Haitians really left the country during the reign of uh, Papa Doc. Uh -huh. That is why yeah. we have such a large number of the best uh, 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 thinkers, or thinkers of Haiti leaving the country at yeah. the time. And Baby Doc picked up He picked he up after off. his dad and, uh, uh, well, it, there were some arrangements between the United States and Baby Doc at the time that supposedly he was going to do better and what have you. But, uh, Unfortunately, the country has gone from bad to worse. To worse. Yeah. And, and where is Baby Doc? Is he in, in France? Actually, he's dead. He died in Haiti oh. when he finally returned to Haiti. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, I think I mentioned to you the surgeon who saved my life. She's a with the Veterans Administration, mm -hmm. and she goes regularly to Haiti uh, uh, doing medical work and other kinds of work, and I contribute a little now and then to her efforts, and she sends me back uh, pictures and all that kind oh, of stuff, what's mm -hmm. going on. And uh, if I had your money, I'd go over and help her. <laughs> 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 so we better start winding down because we're running out of time. Okay. How do we do? Oh, I, 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 am, I am really enjoying this, and I'm glad that uh, I have met you, and certainly I do not need to be sitting here, and I'm hoping that we're going to really go a relationship based on the fact that uh, I hope so. we, share, do that. we share so much. Yeah. Um, Yes, yeah. you talk to my viewers about whatever is on your mind right now. You got uh, half a minute, a minute or so to look in the camera and tell the viewers what you think camera number two uh, would be important to tell them about anything at all. Well, uh, the, the, the thing is I, uh, I feel like uh, uh, right here in Portland that I am also interested in really providing uh, 
uh, the best of myself uh, 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 to the community and that uh, uh, I have instilled the same values that you and I were talking about with my kids. And uh, I think people will realize that, yes, they are people of all sorts of backgrounds that are really contributing to this country. And sometimes when uh, I hear people talk about uh, immigrants, well, I am an immigrant and I have really come here and I have uh, established a good company that is really growing and paying good salaries to those folks that are working for us. And uh, this idea that uh, immigrants are only a, a, a drain. A drain is not really borne by what so many of us who came to this country have done. Well, we're going to need to stop now. We need another two hours, but I think they're going to yell at me if we don't start stop winding down now. Yeah. And uh, to watch my shows on the web, go to www. Uh, donbaham.com and click on favorite links. There's a lot of shows there. The American Civil Liberties Union is very important in our country today because civil liberties are being threatened nowadays by the right wing. Go to that site and learn about the ACLU. To get my shows broadcast regularly by your local public access station, go to www.pegmedia.org and I'm going to have to clean up that editing. To learn how to end corporate personhood, we got to end corporate personhood. Go to www.pegmedia.org to end corporate personhood. Thanks for watching this episode of Conversations with Dr. Don. Our favorite thought for the day is be kind. Remember KFC, not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC. Kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable to you too. And you